without further ado, uh, Mr. Mark, please, stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah. So, hello. <clears throat> now, this talk is probably about 45 minutes, maybe nearer to one hour. We'll see how that goes. So, not too long. Um, just to keep it, uh, keep it very simple. First of all, I'm ex-army, uh, um, serving in a few countries quite a few years ago in the days of West Germany uh, and these sort of locations. Um, that's how I started work. Uh, and traveled with, with them, with the British Army. Uh, and then I enjoyed getting lost by myself in places that people don't go to, uh, in you know, places like North Korea and Iraq and um, uh, East Timor, the sort of places where people don't like to go. That's the sort of person I am. I, I like to go to those places. Um, it's a bit, uh, so it's a nomadic life, but, um, but uh, some very interesting places in Uzbekistan and uh, other places. Uh, I now live in Kuala Lumpur, where I'm the Director of Operations for East Asia for the British Council. Uh, but this is obviously nothing to do with the British Council. This is my, my, uh, my hobby, my hobby of uh, historical research, giving these presentations. Uh, and this is, this is the blurb that was written uh, to promote this series of talks. So that's what I'm interested in. And I now like to do that research and write books. This is the first one specifically about Pankor Laut and its patients and the journey that they went through. Um, but there are other, other books coming up and I'm particularly interested in Malaysia. So these are the, the five parts of the talk. And I'll ask you to remember this date, the 11th of March, 1946. This is a key date. And when you hear me say that date again, you'll know that I'm about to finish. <laughs> okay? So the 11th of March, 1946. All right. So reconstructing this, uh, this map. Now, so I went on holiday there with my family, and they showed me an old dam, the Pankhall Out guides. And they said, Nobody knows who built it or why. So I went home and started to find out who built it and why they built it. And I very quickly found that it was a, a settlement for leprosy patients. But still, I thought there must be a document that actually said, build the settlement on Pankor Lao. There must be an official document. There must be a set of instructions on how to do it. And it was really difficult to find. Most of the world was in lockdown, but must be a document. None of the National Archives have got it. And then I found it. I found it. It was published in 1893, and I found it at Manchester University in England. And it was a report of the committee set up, which was set up by um, Swethenham. He wanted a committee to look at um, the partic particular challenge of leprosy in Parak. And uh, it was published on, on this date. So he put a committee together, said, what is the challenge with leprosy in Parak, and what is the solution? And this document is really interesting. And I may even try to put it as an annex to, to, my, to my book. Um, and uh, this I've managed to retrieve from a library in Manchester University in the UK. It is still the only place in the world I can find it. So I got lucky, really, <laughs> this particular document uh, with this. And it says very clearly, we recommend the island of Pankor Laut as being in every way suited for the purpose of establishing an asylum for Malay lepers, very exclusively only for Malays, right, from the uh, Kampongs along the Parak River. That's where they came from. So here it was. And uh, so I got rather lucky finding that document, putting it together. But it's a little bit like um, um, putting together a jigsaw without the front cover to look at. So I'm piecing together information and clues. And the book is kind of written like a clues. We've got this clue. This means this. So a bit like a whodunit kind of story, if you like. 
and then you realize that there are bits of the jigsaw missing and you have to go and try and find those missing pieces somewhere else and that's essentially what this, uh, this experience has, has been like so what we know then is just before the report was published these two people visited Pankor Lout so Mr. Brewster and Mr. Owen and Mr. Owen has a very interesting history with Pankor Lout and he should be known a lot more uh, through this process uh, he was the district surgeon um, so, you know, obviously, had a, his his medical career. Uh, th this is his field. So this is the earliest visit of Europeans I can find to Pankow Lout. Now, when you go to Pankow Lout, there are even people who think that Colonel Chapman was the first European to go to the island. That's a long time after this, right? So they went there, and they concluded uh, that it was the right place. So they recommended it to the committee. So this was the committee. And they went to Pankow Lout themselves in December 1892. Uh, Elray Jr., it's a, it's a famous person in the history of Parak, of course, uh, in Taiping, uh, Conway Belfold, uh, Jay Wright, and Mr. Gundry Fox. So this was the committee, and they listened to the recommendation of these two, and then wrote their, that report uh, that you saw just now. Um, and they went to the island to see if everything was correct, and it was. So that's, um, that's all in that document um, from, uh, from Manchester University there. So then I started to look around for some old maps. This one is from UK National Archives from 1912. And the red marks are buildings. Right? So this, if you bid to Pank Hall out now, the, the jetty is here. This is the main part. And it's the same jetty, the, the same location of the jetty that's used today in the resort. Um, and there are th three buildings marked here, and this long mark. But this is not a one building. This, I think, represents the Malay houses for the patients spread out across this part of the bay, because there were no big buildings there. So that probably represents or the Malay, um, the, the the accommodation, the kampong houses for the, for the patients. Uh, this map from the Singapore National Archives starts to go into a little bit more detail. So these dots, again, this is the main area at this end of the bay, uh, down here. Um, so when we go back, we're actually staying in villas right there at that spot, um, where the hospital was, where the police station was, and so on. Uh, there are also a couple of buildings here. This is the dam that still exists, this dot here on the map. Um, and there's another building here. This is one that Chapman discovered when he was on the island. He was only there two nights. Uh, but that's on the map there as well. So that's a very useful, uh, useful uh, addition there. So essentially, pretty much this area here. And uh, up here was where the mosque was uh, and the cemetery at the northern end of this part here. So, and these are some extracts from that report. So this is quite useful. It tells, tells them very clearly you need a hospital ward, you need uh, quarters for the apothecary, that's the person in charge. But in fact, I now know that the apothecary never lived there. He lived in Telok Anson. And he visited once a week. Uh, accommodation for the dresser, so another member of staff, a storeroom and dispensary, the Malay houses, uh, the police station lockup, uh, and the Malay mosque. So this is what they are saying: the buildings you need to uh, put in place uh, on the on the island, and uh, they're within that area there. But so, on the western part of the island, that's proposed. Sorry. They were supposed to be on the western side of the island, no? No. So the, the, this side of the island was where Chapman escaped. Yeah. This the side. Recommendation of the, the recommendation. Well, the recommendation was these are the buildings you need. But the report doesn't say where. So you find out where in other clues from other sources. Uh, but that's what they um, uh, said. Now, the, book, the, the, the report also explains where to clear the fields
for um, growing vegetables, uh, where to grow the chormogra trees to get the oil to treat the leprosy. Uh, it goes into lots of other information as well, not just the, uh, not just the buildings that it was proposing. Um, and this was uh, another clue from the Straits Times, where it clearly says that there were six marine police officers based uh, in that police station on Pankor Lao. So that's a clue as to the size of the police station. It was small, right? Um, the report suggests that, I don't know how true this is, but it suggests that generally Malays don't like to go to the doctor. Now, I don't know how true that is, but in the report, it, the thinking was that they're unlikely to go to the hospital until, until they're very, very sick and therefore don't build a big hospital, in, according to the report in its findings. So the hospital was also fairly small. Um, these are, this is the dam that does still exist there. So I took these photographs. This is the dam here, and the water is collected on this side. Uh, and this is the, uh, the dam wall there, located uh, over there. And this is the extract from that document uh, explaining this is a contingency in case of drought. Now, I don't know if there was a drought between 1904 and 1934, so it may not have actually been used. Um, but uh, the dam is there across the ravine. And with the guide, um, we climbed down the wall and followed it down to uh, near Squid Bay here, where there's a natural reservoir. It's off, off the normal hiking track. So down there, there's a natural reservoir, uh, and it follows down. And this dam wall, though, was built 120 years ago, and it's still solid, hmm. and still holding that water back. A trickle of water comes out, and that's what we followed uh, to get down to the end there. Um, the other buildings, uh, were knocked down when they built the resort. Uh, so these are the only ones that are left uh, on the island. So putting together the Singapore archive map, uh, together with the Manchester University report here, um, detailing um, what, what is there. Okay. So now, this, there's more. This is just an extract from the report. But it starts to name the actual uh, mucims along the Parak River, where the patients were identified, uh, and by which apothecaries, and so on. Uh, there's more than this, but there's really quite a large amount of detail, knowing exactly which mukims they came from, from several miles either side of the Parak River. And then they would come on a raft, sitting on a raft, all the way down the Parak River to Telok Anzan, and then wait for the medical officer to have his launch ready to drag the raft across the sea to Pankor Lao. On the raft? Yes. Yep. Um, so, um, so I just show this to you as an example, but there is a lot of information in this report about where they were living. So that documentation took two years, from 1891 to 1893, uh, to put that information uh, together. Um, so, here is the, they, they've taken down, down here to about Telok Anson, right, which is around here. Is my pronunciation correct? Telok, Telok Anson? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then from there, um, tied to the back of the launch, uh, and then dragged across. And, of course, for many of them, this would be their first time at sea, and would experience seasickness. And on arrival in Pankol out, of course, be vomiting. This, this map, which is from a modern day online map on, um, on the internet, still calls it Little Dinding instead of Pankol out um, to this day here. So um, they, they come from New Kims along the Parak River by raft, and then this last journey here across to arrive. So we know. Uh, the exact numbers that came from each mukim and the journey to take them there. 
Um, so this is the end of the, uh, the committee report signed by these four committee members. And they sign off by saying there is a need for urgent action. We've got a leprosy issue in Parak, and it's not being dealt with, right? We've got Pulau Jared Jek, we've got other places, but we need a specific solution for Parak and the Malay sufferers. So that's how they ended the report. This is urgent, it must be done right now. So then it's kind of weird then that it got delayed. So essentially, like a lot of government projects, you know, they come in over budget and they come in, there's delays. This delayed eight years uh, simply because the Secretary of State said, don't build it on Pankol out, build it on another island. So, so there's Pankol out there. And what the Secretary of State said is use one of those nine islands, the Pulau Sambilan. So this is uh, probably a little more than 10 miles south of Pankol out. These are a group of nine islands. You know the Palau Sembalan? Those, one of those. He said, use one of those. And in a moment, I'll show you some um, evidence as to why he said that. Um, but uh, he says, go and choose one of those. So, on the 4th of October, 1897, this group of three people went to the islands uh, of Palau Sambalan to choose one. And two of them were committee members that had recommended Pankol out. So that's a little bit weird, right? They've already seen all the evidence that Pankol out is the perfect place. And they're still going to follow this. Caulfield was a new uh, entrant uh, to that task. So, and so Pulau Sambalan has these islands here. Um, go there, look at them, and choose one. Now, Tajuddin and I went to the Nine Islands uh, a few weeks ago. And we kind of thought that the bigger one has actually made a lot more sense. But they didn't, uh, they didn't recommend that one. Uh, they went with um, Pulau Lalang as their recommendation. So this is from the Malaysia National Archives. And this is actually their report that said, use Pulau Lalang for this purpose, right? Now, it's impossible. Pulau Lalang is very small, right? And some of the documentation at the time, they were talking about up to 850 patients. But that island is so small, there isn't enough drinking water for that many people. And to make it, uh, at that time, the technology of the boats was not like today. They had no outboard motors. So they couldn't get to the island in bad weather. But that group here didn't question the bad weather side of it, um, and still said, pull out a lang. So they went to the Legislative Council to get permission to build the settlement on pull out a lang. And the Legislative Council approved it. Um, this is very embarrassing because it's actually impossible, right? So, uh, pull out a lang. And it's the one you might know. It's famous for the uh, illuminous blue plankton. Although when we were there, there wasn't that much. There was only a little bit. But uh, that island. So, so, this is six years after the report. Six years after the report, and the uh, newspapers are reporting no place can be found within the territory of the Federated Malay States so suitable for the purpose as Pulau Lalang. Those words are from the report talking about Pankor Laut. So the government spin doctors and the journalists have just literally replaced Pankor Laut with Pulau Lalang into these things here. So, but the problem is anybody who knows what the truth is, knows it's impossible. So the government asked Colonel Walker to find out once and for all, is it possible to build a settlement on Pulau Lalang, yes or no? They asked Colonel Walker, who at that time was the acting British resident, Parak. And he put together this team of people. Now, first of all, you notice that he took Brewster and Owen. 
the two people who've known those islands for the last seven years really well. But he took them along. He took along two Pengulus, which is very clever, right? Because you've got to have the village chiefs agreeing to send their residents to an island. And he took those, those two there, so Ahmad Tazir, Haji Muhammad Ali. And all of these people wrote their reports about Pulau Lalang. Very cleverly, he took Commander Mills, who knows something about the sea. And he said, first of all, you've got to build a 200-foot pier to get any chance of landing on this island in bad weather. But even then, don't bother. There's not enough water for lots of reasons. So they all wrote their reports, uh, and he took Mr. Bird. And they all said, forget it, it's impossible. Now, this is embarrassing because the Legislative Council have approved Polalalang. And now this team of people are saying, forget it. So, uh, this photo from the Malaysia National Archives uh, actually is the SS Mina off of Polalalang. It's right there in the National Archives um, from 1900. That is the visit to Polalalang. And in his report, Walker said, we couldn't actually land with this. We couldn't get to the island with this boat. Um, so um, I don't know if this is the first visit by the three people, or whether it's this visit. Uh, but it's certainly the, the National Archives say it is 1900 off Palalalang. Um, so, so then eventually, they had to go back to LegCo, to the Legislative Council, and say, about that Palalalang, we're changing it to Pankor Laut. And the Legislative Council, to avoid further embarrassment, they didn't say yes. They said, we approve any island other than Palaulalang, just to avoid them keep coming back again and again, uh, thinking they may mess up again. So then the Secretary of its approval to use Pankor Laut in place of Palaulalang. And all these documents are in the National Archive. There's a lot of information around uh, about this. So, um, this explains a little bit about why this whole mess up happened. Uh, so, this is um, Treacher who's saying that it was originally supposed, uh, erroneously, uh, that Palau Sasang was not British territory. That's a very complicated sentence. But what he's, what he's saying is, we don't want to put the settlement on a British island. We think that Pulau Sambalan is not British. But it turns out we're wrong. It is British. It's a pretty lame excuse, really, for, for such, a, such a large um, mess up. Um, and then you find from Colonel Walker that they actually had built six houses already on Pulau Lalang and begun the quarters of the apothecary. Now, that's interesting. And that's why Tajuddin and I went to Palau Lalang a couple of weeks ago. I know the site where those six houses were. So we went to the site to see if there's anything remaining. Um, so um, there it is. So this is the shape of Palau Lalang. And I do know that they were here, a, short, uh, a walk up from the bottom of this beach in this area here. So we went there to uh, have a look. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is not the site. This is at the top of the hill on Polalalang. This is our, our man here, Mr. Tajuddin. Uh, this is Justin, who's from YTL. He's their senior naturalist and conservationist uh, coming along with us, because he is an expert conservationist and understands what to look for. So when we went into the site where the six houses were, he could tell us which trees were not from the island and were brought in. They were fruit trees. He could tell us the rocks, which ones had minerals, uh, minerals that are not on that island, and therefore were brought in to build that small dam there. So he could confirm that there was a site there. Um, but unfortunately, the, in the jungle there, it's very thick mud. So we need to go back with long rubber boots to get through that mud to, to explore the site further. Um, but that's quite interesting. Uh, and then Parak states were there with us. The rangers were with us uh, through the whole thing. Um, 
But essentially, uh, it's through there. And we couldn't get all the way through because of the mud, but uh, there needs to be another trip. And Justin is talking about probably four or five days to really get through there. And the rangers from the Parek State Park are forging a footpath around to help us with that endeavor. Um, so that's quite interesting. So there might be some conservation, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, around that. So those houses were built but never lived in. OK, good. So Pank Hall out itself, what do we know? Well, we know that in the beginning, they were not allowed to have boats because they thought they would escape. Right? It's, it's about putting them on the island and they, uh, keeping them away from society, right? Until they fall in love with the island. And at that point, they can have fishing boats and go fishing. Because they felt that then they wouldn't try to escape, right? But in the beginning, they, they weren't allowed to do that fishing. Uh, we know that the first arrivals were on the 29th of February, 1904. We also know that the person who wrote this was not very good at mathematics, right? Because it says there were 18 in the first arrival. That's 15 adults and four children, which is 19, isn't it? <laughs> is, it is, it, is that 19? Um, the only thing I can think, he, he was including the, the non-leprous husband of one of them in that. But anyway, it's a kind of a weird sort of numbers there. But uh, so the Malaysia National Archives have the documented first arrival into the settlement on Pangkor Lao. Uh, we also know that the state surgeon was there to meet them. So Mr. Owen has a really good, a really interesting part to play. So he was the first to visit the island and recommend it with Mr. Brewster. He was part of the group that kicked out the idea of Pulau Lalang. Uh, and here he is back here to help the first arrivals to give them their blankets and take them to their uh, kampong houses. So he's quite an uh, in interesting role to play within this. Uh, we know that the, now the promoted governor visited the island. Sorry about the quality of this article. I'm trying to get a better one. But he visited um, in 1905. And it, what it does talk about trying to improve their lives, even back as early as that trying to make the lives better for the patients. We know that uh, in 1906, at least, there were 37 patients on the island. We also know from here that they then had a problem getting more. So there was a delegation of Pengulus from along the Parak River that went to the island as a part of uh, a marketing effort uh, to, to convince them to send more. So this delegation took place um, to Pankor Lam. Um, we've got lots of documents here. This is from Malaysia National Archives giving us some of the names of the patients that were sent there. So that's quite interesting. Um, have you heard of uh, Joshua? So Joshua is quite a famous a leprosy sufferer himself, who documented a lot of very useful information in 1983. Put this together. Um, so 1926 was a year of improvement, uh, significant improvement for the lives of the patients, not just at Pankol Out, but in Jerajek uh, and around the country. Right? And it all started when Dr. Travers went to Singapore and presented three years earlier about focusing on their life improving the life for them, uh, not focusing on being an inmate, but rather focusing on being a patient and improving their life. So we, you probably know about the Camp 4 chalets in Pulau Jerajé, but at the same time as part of the same initiative was a new construction on Pankol Out. They knocked down the kampongs and built them the chalets, like the ones in Sungai Bolong. Uh, so that's quite interesting. So, and he talks about this, those one-room chalets. So this photo I took in Songai Bolo, but that's what they would have looked like uh, on Pankor Laut. 
um, and they moved in the following year, in 1927. So that was a, a good year, a good year for them. And interestingly, Joshua talks about a Brazilian visitor called uh, Dr. De Souza Araújo, who was a very famous leprosy doctor in the world. And he was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation in New York to visit 40 countries, 4-0, 40 countries. And he wrote a great book, which I'll show you in a moment, called Leprosy Survey in 40 Countries. And one of them was the Federated Malay States. But I first heard about it from, in Joshua's book. So he visited Pulau Tenga, which is uh, an old local name for Pankolaut, uh, to the settlement. <coughs> so, and this is the Brazilian doctor. This is Dr. Arujo, de Souza Arujo, um, and he uh, wrote his great book there. Very difficult to get a copy of this book. First of all, it's written in Portuguese, right? from Brazil. But I, during lockdown, contacted this wonderful library in Sao Paulo, which is, as you can see, it's uh, Hansen's Disease Library. Hansen's Disease is leprosy, right? Um, and they scanned it for me, um, and this, the, the Federated Malay States chapter. And here he talks about uh, Pankor Lao, going into it. So this, he visited Pankor Lao in January 1926. Um, so that's really, really useful information. Uh, Josh, Joshua talks about, uh, he gets asked to give some data here. Um, you can see this is Sungai Bolo settlement. This is another Kuala Lumpur asylum. There's another one. And um, pull out, pan call out. But what I thought was interesting here, number five, absconded. So you look how many absconded from pull out, pan call out, and it's zero. They had fishing boats at that time. They could have escaped, but they didn't. Um, but 1933 in Sungai Balo, 52 absconded. And 1932, the year before, 74 absconded from Sungai Balo. So at that time, Sungai Balo has not reached its potential yet. And people are still trying to escape. People are not trying to escape from Pankol out. Even though they had the boats, they could have, could have done so. so. But there's lots of... Uh, Lots of data around. I just thought I'd show you that one uh, from, uh, from Joshua. So Joshua talks about the movement of the patients from Pankol out and the other places as well to Sungai Bolo. Now this made perfect sense. Sungai Bolo settlement described by the Brazilian doctor as the most advanced center in the world. Not the biggest, the biggest was in the Philippines. But the, what they were doing to try to improve the lives of the patients, he said, is exactly what they should be doing worldwide. Very well respected Sungai Balo um, settlement. So between 1930 and 34, they're moving the patients from Pankol out to Sungai Balo. But the final 37 did not want to go. Why do you want to go, right? Pankol out is lovely, right? We go fishing, we've, we grow our own vegetables. Um, but the thinking was to bring everybody together, have this national leprosarium, all the research, everything in one place. Um, so what's interesting here is that there's another delegation now, a delegation from Sungai Bolo to Pankol out to try to convince them. And they talk about a superstition about a veritable epidemic of deaths. And that is very relevant because it's true. This idea that there would be a large number of deaths really happened. It just didn't happen on Pankol out. It happened in Sungai Bolo. So they were correct with this premonition, but they actually took them to the place where it happened which is quite interesting, actually, when you think about it. Um, so, well, and we'll come on to that in a moment. So, so 14 went 1933, final 37. So 51 Pankol outpatients now moved to Sungai Bolo. And now we're going to follow the story of those 
51 uh, at Songhai Balor. So what do we know? We know that um, it's not just today that people haven't heard of a settlement on Pangkor Laut. At that time, as you can see from this document from the Malaysia National Archives, there were lots of people who didn't, didn't know that there was a settlement on Pangkor Laut, and they were sending Malay patients to Sungai Balor, and Sungai Balor was saying, got another one, send them to Pangkor Laut, where they should have gone, because that's where Malay patients go. So it's not just today that people don't know, it's even at that time. Um, and this particular writer um, um, talks about them as bad hats, which is not a very nice thing to say. But essentially, um, and, uh, these Pankol out patients arrive in Sungai Bolo and ask to go back to Pankol out, which is why the book is called Going Back. People want to go back to Pankol out. Um, so uh, they cause trouble at Pankol out. And uh, he doesn't know that there is a police station lockup on Pankol out because he thinks they should have been stayed in that lockup. But instead, they've been put in the lockup at Sungai Bolo, which still exists today. The lockup at Sungai Bolo, it's got a different purpose now. Um, but there's lots of documents like this which portray a real challenge, right? So even though they're booked there, not everybody there wants them there. Um, it's quite difficult. So, Pankol out leper settlement closed in 1934. Also in 1934, the colony of Dindings is given back to the Sultan of Parak. And I have the document from the UK Parliamentary Archives formally giving that colony to the Sultan of Parak. So why? One year later, is the newspaper saying that the Pankol Out settlement is reopening in 1935. The newspapers are reporting that Pankol Out settlements will reopen shortly. And that is odd. And it was confirmed by the UK Parliamentary Archives, where I retrieved this document, which is the Pulau Pankol Out Settlement Ordinance, saying they can continue. So from a historical perspective, that's interesting, right? So they can continue. You know, it made perfect sense to send everybody to Sungai Valor. But as you'll find out, that veritable epidemic of deaths really happened. You know, so hindsight is a wonderful thing, right? If they'd gone to Pankhall out, the occupation might have been different for them. But nobody would have known, right? So, uh, so they've got permission to reopen, but they didn't. So then we move into the pre-war bliss era. And uh, this is Sungai Balor settlement. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, this is the eastern section. So Malay patients were all in this, this section here. Now the Pankor Lao patients were in these huts here by the mosque. And at that time it, they were Indian patients, but they moved the Indian patients out so that our 51 Pankor Lao patients could live in these huts right here. And that's relevant because during the occupation, the MPAJA fighters came down here from the jungle, straight to the spot where the Pankol out patients were living. And we also know that the MPAJA fighters were sleeping in the Pankol out's huts with them during the occupation. So let's just give you an idea there. This mosque, that mosque still exists. So I took this photo. That's where our Pankol out patients were praying in Sungai Balor. That still exists today. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about a man called Gordon Ryrie. Have you heard about Gordon Ryrie? Mm -hmm. Gordon Ryrie is uh, an incredible person, right? So he was superintendent of the Sungai Balor settlement. When the Japanese are coming down, Europeans are getting on boats back to the UK, right? He turned down his ticket on the boat. He wanted to stay with his patients. That decision meant that he died young. That decision. But he stayed to look after his patients. He's also the first person that I come across that would talk about love. You know, his view of the patients and how to treat them. So when he arrived, 
the first thing he did was to get rid of all the security guards. He said, this is not a prison, right? This is, this is a hospital, this is a patient's. Um, he gave them jobs, he gave them a life. But he talked about love, and he was the first person I found across that would get to that particular stage. So this is uh, a note from his obituary um, talking about what he did at Sungai Bolo. So this obviously is for all the patients at Sungai Bolo, not just our 51 Pankol outpatients, um, but it's still relevant to the story. So we know that uh, he tended the worst patients himself, changed their bandages, did it himself. We know that he gave the patients jobs, gave them a life. He also, at that time, Sungai Bolo settlement had its own money, printed money, because people were scared of catching leprosy from the paper. He did the research to prove that that was rubbish so that they could use real money. But again, it's this attempt to, to um, you know, treat them as, 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 as people. Uh, there's the uh, sports clubs, everything. His wife taught in the school. The school is still there in Songhai Bolo settlement. They had sports days. They had a, had a, this is the height of the story, the happiest part of the story, um, very much so. And as it says here, often the ones that were cured at that stage would say, can we stay? Right? So um, the, you can see now, at this stage, at least, you'd be thinking that for the Pankal outpatients, this is a good place to be. Right? Um, and then along came the war. So that now, Gordon Ryrie has refused the ship. He's staying here with his patients. And what he did is quite remarkable. And this is from Joshua's book. He scared the Japanese. He knew that they, they had a leprosy problem in Japan. And he figured that the Japanese military commanders would be scared. So he took them on a tour. So in that first week of Kuala Lumpur in occupation, there's chaos, right? Nobody knows what's happening. Gordon Ryrie is thinking ahead. He wants to scare them so that they don't come back. So he took them to see the worst patients deliberately. Then he took them into a room to decontaminate them for longer than might even be necessary to scare them. And he really scared them. That's incredible, isn't it, in itself. At that moment, you know, how many people are that clear thinking? Uh, gave them some drugs, let them go, right? And then uh, and they left it alone. In fact, the Japanese left it alone for two years. Right? Uh, we'll come on to that in, in a moment. So he does that. Unfortunately, he was so good at scaring the Japanese, the MPAJA realized the settlement would be a good place for them. Because if there's no Japanese, the fighters from the MPAJA can live in the settlement. And so they did. So Gordon Ryrie did such a good job that the MPAJA moved in. And they moved in uh, to those chalets in the east section around by the mosque there where our 51 Pankol outpatients are. So, um, so this is quite an interesting time. And uh, Joshua talks about how the, the fighters would often pretend to be patients, wrapping their hands in bandages, these sorts of things. He talks about um, times when um, the MPHA fighters would get injured in a battle somewhere. They'd go into Sungai Bolo settlement, put a gun to the British doctor's head, take him into the jungle, make him save the life of their fighter, and bring that British doctor back in the morning. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of activity going on around here. Right? Uh, but we also know that they were then sleeping in those huts. So, so here we are. So we've got Ryrie's brilliant decoy going on over here. And we've got lots of interesting activity around here where our, where our um, patients are living. So now, Gordon Ryrie wrote an article after the war about Sungai Bolo settlement under Japanese occupation. And what he says very clearly 
is that the Japanese threaten to machine gun all of them every week. Right? They're threatening to machine, or he says, bomb out um, every week. But they didn't do it. So before the war, the British had a system where each state would pay money for the upkeep of Sungai Balor. So, so uh, Parak State have got 51 patients there. So they're going to pay 51 shillings per day for the upkeep of Sungai Balor settlement. Makes sense, right? Japanese continued it, but kept the money. So what he says, and he's being very blunt here, is that they kept the money because the patients were profitable. So, so he, he thinks about 1,500 pounds a month going into the pocket of the Japanese governor, which, according to the Bank of England, with their inflation calculator, is about 72,000 pounds a month in today's money, going into the Japanese governor's pocket. And he said that's why they didn't shoot them. So starvation, a malnutrition, multiple diseases. So what percentage is that of the... Over half. Uh, over half. Yeah. So uh, by the beginning of 1944, half the patients uh, were uh, dead. Uh, now, have you heard of Gestapo psychosis? So I hadn't heard of this before I read Gordon Ryrie's article. So the Gestapo, of course, were the German secret police. Here it was the Kempetai, right? The Japanese secret police. But he's using this as a medical term. And essentially, this is a mental illness brought about because you are convinced that you were going to be killed by the secret police. Every day, you think you're going to be killed by the secret police. And that creates this mental condition, which, which he uses this term, Gestapo psychosis. So in his report, uh, he says the patients would have this Gestapo psychosis, starvation, malaria, pellagra, multiple concurrent diseases. So trying to treat the patients is virtually impossible, right? So the symptoms you're seeing, you can't actually monitor the progress of the leprosy because those symptoms could be from anything, right? So it just gave you an idea what um, uh, life may have been like uh, for the patients going through this. Um, there's an interesting um, incident which uh, uh, Joshua writes about. Um, and this is an artistic impression of it from Manje, who's been doing some uh, graphic, um, uh, some drawings for me for the book. Um, so essentially, uh, the Japanese uh, attacked. Okay? They attacked because their, their informers are telling them that the MPAJA are secretly using it and pretending to be patients. So the Japanese are now attacking into Sungai Balor settlement. And in the attack, this is the first raid that they did, um, they penetrated into the eastern section. Everything happens in the eastern section where the Malay patients are, right? And they catch the MPAJA by surprise. And so there's an MPAJA fighter uh, dead with a rifle still strapped to his back because they weren't expecting it, right? It was a surprise. So uh, in this, this is the first drawing. I think any, I haven't found another one anywhere. Um, but this is the Japanese soldier. This is the fighter. And I don't know if there was a patient watching. I don't know. But even if, even if there wasn't, this is still going to cause problems. The Japanese are now coming in and attacking and fighting with the MBJ, literally on the doorstep of our pancall out patients. So even if they didn't physically see it, it's still going to have a real negative impact right, on, on what's going on there. But we do know it was at the back of a hut um, there. Um, and this drawing is based on an actual building in, um, in Sungai Balor. So it took place. Uh, and it's very possible, because we know they were sleeping in the huts of the Malay patients, that this might actually be the scene, right? He may have come out and then just been shot as he's running out of the, out of the, uh, out of the chalet. So this raid made the MPAGA 
even more ruthless. So there are informers in the settlement that are telling the Japanese occupiers, so now the MPJ are going to root out anybody that might be an informer and kill them. And what Joshua says is, they killed some patients. Right? So, um, uh, and they did this with the Chang Pao, and they would often wear it themselves. So what he says, quite a few patients are said to have disappeared in this way. One new patient arrived and was dealt with the next day. So if somebody said they're an informer, that would be enough evidence. So things are getting uh, pretty bad there. There was then a second attack by the Japanese. But this time, the MPAGA set up an ambush, and the Japanese lost. And they never came back. But you can imagine, if you're a Japanese platoon commander, it's really going to be difficult to rally the troops to have another battle. It's coming near the end of the war now. The British have made lots of gains in Burma. The Americans are making gains elsewhere. You know, it must have been really tough to rally the troops to go and have another fight, right? This situation. And particularly as they lost, um, they didn't come back. So, it's 1945. And then, of course, we saw the atomic bombs landing in 1945 on Japan. And then on the 15th of August, 1945, what happened? They surrendered. Joshua writes about a very interesting incident that happened straight after the surrender in Sungai Balo settlement, right by the mosque, right by the chalets where the Pankol outpatients are living. This very interesting incident took place. So immediately following the surrender, a group of presentable individuals in neat white uniforms walked into the eastern section they introduced themselves as an inspector of police, a physician, journalists, and writers. They'd just come out of the jungle, and they were walking to Kuala Lumpur. The war was over. That's an interesting incident, isn't it? Once again, it's right by that area in the eastern section where our 51 Pankol outpatients had been moved to. So that's quite interesting. So war is now over, but it would take many years for Songhai Balo settlement to get back to where it was. That pre-war environment was fantastic, right? It's going to take many years to get to that point. So here is that beginning of that extraordinary article by Gordon Ryrie after the war. What he says, essentially, is um, that at the, this uh, beginning, there were 2,510. Um, at the end, um, the number 660. Now, most of those would die from disease or malnutrition. He also writes that when the, when the Japanese, they destroyed most of the records, and they invented records, to pretend that it was at least as good as it was under the British. There was no research. They were just pretending. And when they did autopsies uh, of the patients, they would find, for example, grass in the stomach, right? It's malnutrition. It's starving to death, right? But the official reason the Japanese would write would be something like senility. Nothing like it, right? The, uh, uh, the real reasons, right? So. But, um, but the numbers, um, you'll see different numbers, but I'm, I go with Gordon Ryrie's uh, numbers here. Uh, so about 1,850 deaths. So the question really, in fact, really the only question for me left to answer in this talk is how many of our 51 Pankol outpatients survived that? And that's a difficult question to answer, right? We know from Gordon Ryrie that most of the Record books were destroyed uh, by the Japanese. So how can we find that? Well, at Sungai Balo, the current generation of leprosy doctors are also you know, outstanding and extremely nice people. And they spend a lot of time looking on every shelf, trying to find old records. 
and they found a couple of old records. I can't show you what's inside because of um, patient confidentiality, right? Uh, but th this is the front cover of uh, one of them. And I sat there going through them, uh, what there is. There's only two. Um, and they were the arrivals post-1935. But that's not what I need, right? Because the Pankol outpatients arrived just before that. They arrived between 1930 and 34. This is the arrivals after that. That's not what I need, right? And I was beginning to wonder if I was ever going to answer this question. How many got through this, to this end of this story? Um, and the doctor sitting next to me at Sungai Balor Center pulled out a record from the back of the book that she had there. And it was a record of deaths post-war. Now think about this, right? If, if I can identify all the pan call out patients that died after the war, that would be the same number of ones that survived. See the logic? If the record is complete and all the years are there, it appears to be complete, I may be able to answer that question. How many uh, pan call out patients survived the occupation? And it was two. of the 51, right? So uh, these are initials. I can't give you their full name, but I'm told I can give the initials. So they are Malay patients, last place of residence, Pankor Lao. Uh, this one died 1945 from uh, cerebral malaria. So this cause of death would be accurate, right? This is after the occupation. Uh, that's only a couple of months after the ceasefire, right? That's only December. Um, and this patient who died on that date I showed you at the beginning, the 11th of March, 1946, was the date I showed you at the beginning of this talk. Um, and uh, he died from pulmonary tuberculosis. So what that suggests then is that 86% of patients overall died during the occupation, but 96% of our pancall out patients died. So the question, why is the percentage higher for pancall out patients? And I suspect that is something to do with the location of their chalets, being the point where the fighting took place, being the point where the MPHA were coming down and looking for informers. Um, I suspect maybe this is to do with the physical location, because that's where all the action was taking place, right? Possibly, right? Um, so, we have, I think, quite a story of the patients of Pankol out leper settlement. From that extraordinary document in 1893 explaining the problem, explaining exactly where all the patients are living, which mucums, how many, explaining, take them on a raft down to Taluk Ensign, get them from there across to Pankhall out. On Pankhall out, um, some of the patients didn't survive that time and are buried up by the helipad in the northern part of the island, and they're buried there now. Um, some, of them, uh, um, some of them were cured, although I'm told by the National Leprosy Center that the treatment of the Tormogra oil from the tree wouldn't actually cure them. It would just lower the symptoms. So I'm told by the center now that they would have been uh, returned back to their mucum, but would have developed leprosy again. Um, but we don't know what happened to them. Um, to the upgrading of their accommodation in 1926, all the visitors to the island, and then being moved to Sungai Bolo with that um, premonition of a veritable epidemic of deaths the delegation to convince the final 37 to go down, to have those wonderful pre-war years uh, started by Dr. Travers and then by Gordon Ryrie, where they would have had a very good life, where things were really changing, and then through the horrors of the Japanese occupation, all the way through to the 11th of March, 1946. 
when the last known pancall out patient who wasn't cured passed away from pulmonary tuberculosis. I think, and I hope you agree with me, that this forgotten history should no longer be forgotten. Thank you. There we are. So I think it's quite a story. Actually, I'll just show you one more little thing here, because I, I know that Tajuddin hasn't seen this. Uh, this is uh, this from a, uh, uh, an obituary about Gordon Ryrie, right? He refused to get on the boat, stayed with his patients. Then, before the first Japanese attack, he was interned in Singapore and got very sick, very, very sick. But instead of, and then when, at the end of the war, he was offered a boat from Singapore back to UK. Instead, he walked. That's a long walk, right, to Sungai Bolo, to see his patients. That's quite something. Huh? Hmm? He was an internment camp in Singapore. Yeah. When he's very, very sick. That's incredible, huh? Yeah. What a character. Yeah. I just thought I'd throw that thing at the end there. It's one of the things in the epilogue of the book, uh, things that, uh, that went on after that. Anyway, there we go. Thank you. Thank you.